Hi, Julia. How are okay. you? Um, so this is Julia Wolf, um, composer extraordinaire. Um, at least for me, I, I feel like I fell in love with Mink Stoll. I think that actually Mink Stoll was one of the first scores I ever saw. Um, and then uh, and then more recently, I think Steel Hammer and Anthracite Fields, I just found to be unbelievably moving. Um, and then of course, I feel so fortunate you wrote me a solo violin piece called Spinning Jenny. With your name in the title. <laughs> Fun. Yay, so um, I remember doing a book report when I was a kid on um, traditional uh, American kind of handicrafts and it included spinning Jenny and I did oh, great yeah really so but you I know that you pull so much from kind of American um not folklore but American experience um and I was hoping that you could tell me a little bit more about that how you find your sources of of kind of inspiration because um for different ones of your works i've i've noticed or i've read that that there were different um personal points of inspiration yeah um well first of all it's a thrill to work with you again um it's really really fun to to work to, you know done a little zoom feedback and and conversing so that that's always so fun and so I'm thrilled about that um so the folklore, folk, there actually is an element of folklore too, um, but the folk music is, is pretty deeply in there for me. I mean, I'm a child of rock and roll, but also I have very um, early roots in American folk music. So uh, especially when I got to college, I was playing folk guitar and picking up the mountain dulcimer, learning the bones. Um, I was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's a very big folk town, one of the most famous folk coffee houses. The Ark is there. And um, so a lot of interesting people came through town. And my music is, uh, my musical life has always been this interesting, for me, interesting combination of uh, American folk music, experimental contemporary music, um, and the interesting intersections between the two. So uh, so there's, there's a lot of fiddling. Um, <laughs> And you'll hear that in Ming Stoll as well. Um, so yeah, they're very natural musical connections for me personally. I wanted to ask you, because I feel like in a lot of your works, um, I think including Ming Stoll, you're always kind of bringing forward the stories of people that we haven't always heard from. Um, and I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about um, Mink Stoll and, and the meaning of the title and the role of the violin and, and piano within that piece? Yeah, um, you know, my early creative roots are, are with words and I, st I went to college thinking I was going to study social sciences. And I was interested in so sociological and political issues. Um, and it's in the music, it's in the titles. Eventually it made its way into text using, using uh, a lot of American labor history texts and um, focusing on important labor history issues. But it was very important to me when I was just thinking about music, no text, um, what, how is it that we can express these ideas that um, are extra musical? Um, so I always begin with some sort of concept or story or element that um, is outside of the music. With Ming Stoll, it was really fun to think about um, the idea of what, what used to make women glamorous. Well, it was that Mink Stoll, you know, it was that gorgeous rap. Um, and how we've evolved. Um, and our, I was thinking about the virtuosity being the new Mink Stoll. So we don't actually need to wear the stole. It's fine, <laughs> whatever, but we don't really need that Mink Stoll. And, and laying it, I was particularly thrilled to have a woman up front playing this work because, um, that's what I was thinking about at the time. That it's the virtuosity and the sort of fero ferocity, ferocity, whatever it was, for feistiness and fierceness of the playing that that gives that kind of power to it. So it's it's a fun play on the on the image. Um, it's I have several pieces that I kind of think of as my feminist manifestos. Um, of course, it's just in music, so not everybody to see it right up front. But uh, and this is one of them. It's, you know, you're out there. You you're like a powerhouse you know, fiddling it down. So 
I, mean, I think in the COVID times, I have a mask. So I feel like one of those um, mask comic book <laughs> characters. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was really interesting to meet you in person the first time, I think, because um, I had known your music first and there is such a kind of fierceness and there's a kind of no holding back. Um, and then you're so gentle in person. <laughs> Not that I expected you to be, um, you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of screaming in my face. But um, it, it kind of reminded me this kind of um, how music can uh, reveal, I think, on the inside who we are. Um, and I think what I admire so much about you is not only uh, your artistry, um, but kind of your perseverance and you were, you're, you, you are so revolutionary um, in terms of the background you came from um, musically and how you kind of pushed this new um, voice into classical music. Um, was that something that, did you feel embraced into classical music or, or by kind of, I, I'm just curious myself because of my own experiences. Um, did you feel embraced um, when you first entered the music world or was it just something? Um, definitely not. <laughs> so um, <laughs> well, I entered, but I, um, well, first of all, I, I, that, the comment you made about that I have a sort of kind of easygoing personality and then I write this sort of really more kind of aggressive over the top music. Um, I've heard this before and, and it is really interesting. I think that artists um, can be so different from their art and I, I draw strength um, on kind of amassing power, less times from large groups of instruments or even in this case in a duo. You guys are both sort of full steam the whole time and, um, and there's something very exciting about that to me but there often can be this mismatch of uh, an artist's demeanor and then what really excites them in terms of music. So I, I, I do recognize that. And you know, I also felt like some of that might've come out because I remember having you know, struggles through, through various music programs uh, in the old days um, when what I was doing wasn't so welcomed. And, and you know, hearing various comments, oh, women, they write very, Pretty music, you know. It's usually like a little tune flute melody, or whatever, you know. Um, and so you wrote like rock, <laughs> and I was like, I, I'm not going to do that. You know, it was just it was a sort of a challenge hearing that feedback and and, and the kind of expectation people had uh, that it should be a certain kind of gentle, sweet, whatever what the, what they would expect from me. And so it was. It's good. I like a challenge, and um, I, I love the athleticism. It's so fun to watch you play. Soul and and I think a lot about the physicality and the athleticism. So, but you know, the the, the road's been been uh, interesting and an interesting journey. You know, I definitely came in from the outside in the sense that I, like I said, I started starting a liberal arts program, an alternative liberal arts program, uh, which is a great place. You know, we were, we were at protests, I think, more than we were in class in the classroom. <laughs> um, this was at, at University of Michigan at the, at the residential college. And um, so really interesting thinkers and um, it's, it's, it's still with me, but as I entered a, a more narrow idea about art and music, I, I felt really uh, constricted. And so I had to kind of bust out. And some of that busting out was writing, working in theater and working with um, some choreographers, um, but then eventually, um, you know, teaming up with my, with my buddies, uh, Michael Gordon and David Lang at Bang in a Can, um, that was very liberating because they're like, anything's possible, you know? And so I think that for a lot of artists, finding your home base and, and like-minded thinkers uh, is an incredible support in, in, in what could be a very isolated activity, you know, yeah. in the studio writing music. But um, but uh, it's it's been challenging, definitely fit some walls at different times. Um, but at a certain point you go, oh well, you know, let's <laughs> do what I do. I think I admire you though, because sometimes people I think can carry that kind of wound for the rest of their lives. Um, and what I really admire is that um, you do a summer program for other composers so that they feel that part of community that I that you kind of spoke about with um, David and Michael. And so what was kind of your inspiration point to kind of start that festival? Um, it's a good question. You know, why do we start any of these things? I think that um, it's because we had a certain kind of experience, some positive experiences, but some experiences uh, in musical context that felt like something was missing. 
And so it, you know, starting the festival, it's kind of like, well, we don't really fit in anywhere. Let's create um, a scene or, or create, create a world that we feel really good in. And the Summer Institute, which is up at Massamoka, where I am now, actually I'm up in Massachusetts, Northwestern Massachusetts. Um, uh, it's just so fun to dive in and create a summer festival that um, seems really like all the fun things we would have wanted to do. So performers coming from all over the world, they're young, they're sort of the beginning of their careers in their 20s and 30s, and um, playing music all by living composers. So I guess one of the biggest points is that in a lot of summer festivals, there might be a contemporary component, but it's sort of on the side, maybe it's advertised, maybe not. And this was all about music of today and living composers. And so the composers and the performers all hang out and are making music and reading down crazy rhythms all day long. Um, and it's just probably it's the, so maybe some of the more experimental people and the environments that they're in and then they meet each other. It's kind of like a you know, dating service we say sometimes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and they, they go out, they, they meet there, they, they start their own festivals, they start their own record labels. And, and we really wanted to not like let's say hold in like, you know, the reins just that we're doing this. There's another generation is going to leave their mark on, on the scene. And so, um, yeah, lots of people formed ensembles out of that festival. And so we hope to get back up and running when everyone's out of their cages. I love the fact that um, you kind of built the world that you wished had been open to you, right? And um, that's really, I admire that so much. Um, and creating that environment for the younger generation, right? So that they have a better experience, a more positive experience. And then for me, I, I love the fact if people will actually go much further than I do in my lifetime, right? So that I think that's what you're doing. Huh? So you've gone pretty far. <laughs> And I know I should also say, like, I love working with the, the large um, institutions as well, you know, but it really feels good to come to them. And I think you're probably experienced this as well. You come to them with who you are, um, as opposed to knock on the door. <laughs> is anybody going to answer my knock? Um, you know, this, is, this is who I am. This is what I do. And so when that that happens, it's, I mean, I love my home base at Bang in the Camp, but also, you know, as part of my life is interfacing with orchestras or um you know, choirs in different contexts. And so uh, then they can see sort of what you've built and who you are. And if it makes sense for them, that's that's also great too. But I think it's it's good to know who you are and, and to start from there and then and then have a conversation. So I think Mink Stoll, I, I love Mink Stoll, first of all, because it's um, an early piece, right? And then um, what you were kind of talking about, the expectations, um, that women are supposed to play in 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 a pretty way. They're supposed to make pretty art, right? Um, but it's what I really loved about working on Mink Stoll and, and what I love in the piece is that it embraces all sides. So there is that, there are those sweet melodic moments, right? And it's really contrasted. And it's some, so, sometimes it's pretty, um, it's, it's pretty, um, immediately contrasted, right? It's it's kind of moving back and forth pretty quickly. Um, and I was actually thinking how truthful it is um, to people's kind of internal emotional states, right? Because we're not just all one constant emotion for the entire day, right? A lot of times, I mean, we can't act it out as adults, you know, like maybe babies can do that. Like, oh, I'm kind of great. Oh my God, I'm cold, you know, but <laughs> as adults, we- I like that. That's sort of what the piece is like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's like, oh, wait, I like this. Oh, no. <laughs> but it's really how human beings, I think, I mean, we learn not to do that uh, outwardly to everybody else. But I think um, kind of emotionally we're like that. So I, I really love, I love the truth in in your piece. Well, it was really fun to rehearse with you guys because um, we could play with that. You know, I remember sitting in rehearsal saying, it's kind of schizophrenic. And by schizophrenic, you know, it's the use of the word, obviously, but um, that, you could be like, like you're saying, it's like super sweet, and um, and then suddenly, you know, something kind of breaks in and, and disrupts it, and then it flows back out. So that kind of shifting back and forth um, is a lot of the character of the piece. Um, how one contrasts another, how one morphs into the other, and um, so yeah, it's fun to fun to play with that. And you guys 
rocked it. <laughs> I love the fact that in the rehearsal, I mean, this is all on Zoom because of the pandemic, but um, in the rehearsal that you added actually like four extra bars on the end, which was fun that like, that's what I love working with composers, right? Um, because every day is different, you know, and, and how we hear things. I mean, for me as a performer, how I hear heard something a year ago to today or how I would play something is totally different. And it was, I, I thought it was really, really cool, actually. I actually can't believe I did that. I, I was like, oh, I, I just changed the piece. You know, it's, it's <laughs> do I have to change the date of completion? No, but, but it's, no, it's good that you're so open to it too, because uh, yeah, you're, I'm always hearing things in different ways. And even if the, the body of the piece is there, um, suddenly you realize, oh, what if that violin's just trailing off at, at the end? It's, it's supposed to, you know, a sharp cut both to, both players together. Um, you know, maybe both versions work, but it's, it's. I'm a tweaker. Uh, I'd like to say pieces are, are finished, finished, but watch out if I get, <laughs> get close to a piece again. I'll, oh, let me rethink that. There have been a few pieces I've actually re seriously revised. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's just in those moments of working with a player, maybe something you did sort of suggest to them. I just thought, there's Jenny, and why should it just end right there? Maybe it should just dissipate, you know? And so it's great to, it's good to, have, that liber to have that liberty. Do you, so do, do you write pretty closely for your performers? Um, if you know the person that's playing it or the ensemble or the group, um, or is it something that you're like, oh, okay, this is, uh, for 40 member chorus or something like that? Or do you really think about um, like the individuals within? Well, I love to think about the individuals and when I can, I, I do. I and mean, I've definitely drawn inspiration from, from performers. Um, it's such a gift and to get, it's my favorite thing to get in the room with a performer and just try things out, hear what the things they love to do are and, um, and just think about their their energy and, and their their incredible skill set. Um, everyone has very different skill sets, obviously playing different kinds of music. So that's my favorite thing. Um, it doesn't always happen, and and it's interesting. Sometimes I haven't had the chance to meet the group. And I could think, of, you know, one example. I wrote a string orchestra piece, Cruel Sister, and I didn't get to meet the group, and it was premiered. And someone who was in a different string orchestra came and heard that premiere, and they were like. That's, that, that piece is for us, that, that's, our, that's our piece. I just like, hear that. And so it transferred to the other group and then they really lived the piece. So I guess I was writing it for them in my, in my consciousness, even though I didn't know I was. Um, so there are times where I've written it, but then someone else picks it up and makes it their own. And, and that's also really exciting and rewarding. But I guess if I can, I think about um, the player. And there are times where I think about challenging the player and if I'm writing, I remember the, this this recent piece of the New York Philharmonic. I was like, I have to try to do something that they don't usually do. And you know, there are orchestral moments in the piece. I mean, it sounds like an orchestra for the most part. Um, sometimes it sounds like a factory, actually. But um, but that's fun too to just think uh, they do this thing. But what if they did this other thing and try to kind of push the push the form a little bit, um, you know, bring it closer to the world that I'm coming from. So um, sort of this combination of leaning from the player and then maybe offering something that's um, new. When you have works um, that are performed, you know, by a number of different, uh, or, or I'm always curious about this because I feel like sometimes composers have like a very set idea and it doesn't matter who's playing it, that this is just the piece and it has to fit within this parameter, right? And, um, but in other ways, I, so I'm, I'm curious um, if your concept of, if, if your concept has ever shifted according to the performer, like maybe, um, because personally I found it really uh, liberating when I was younger to do new music because composers are so flexible. So it was a discussion versus, um, my training was pretty, um, um, well, pretty, it was specifically German, Germanic Austrian <laughs> tradition, right? Um, or Viennese school and, and yeah, very European based, um, which is 
which means that it's just constantly like, oh, what does that like dash mean in the Schubert? Is that a dash or is that a comma? Or did he mean a dot? You know, so it's, you'll spend like hours in rehearsal, like trying this or this. And then, and then uh, sometimes I just feel like we should just play this and see what's natural. And I feel like that would be fine. But um, so I, but I found it liberating working with composers because, um, there was flexibility, but not every single composer is like that. But have you ever found that um, you or you realize something different about your piece from a performance from a different performer oh. or a different ensemble? Yeah, I mean, and, and hopefully a, a strong piece lasts through many different realizations. Um, but uh, it totally changes. I mean, that's one of the things I love about music is um, it's been a channel through, uh, God knows where I get the music from, channels from somewhere. And then it comes through me and then it goes through you, you know? And so there's a certain kind of channel. There's gonna be a chemistry that happens. It's gonna be like no one else playing it. And and yes, there's, there's the piece you know, more or less because it is notated. I am a control freak in the sense that it's pretty darn notated. There's a few open, somewhat open notation things that we went over, but um, which is fun. I like to free it up in certain spots so you're not totally tied to the page. But it's, it's really it's really notated music. But nonetheless, it's just a bunch of dots on a piece of paper. So when it lives and breathes, it's really going to live and breathe through the player. And I I love that. And um, th I mean this piece in particular, Meg Stolman, has been sitting in the box. You know, I mean, we did it early on, and um, so. You're reviving it, Jenny. <laughs> you know, I, I, I had loved writing it, and, and it's been played a couple, you know, a few times, and by some great players. But I, it really hasn't been played for a while that I know of. I, mean, I guess I haven't kept track, but that I or that where I've interfaced with the performer. So it's really fun to remind myself of, of where I where I was and what I was thinking, and um, and it totally changes. It's been a beautiful realization of the piece, and. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's that's one of the joys. I never feel something is sort of stuck in, in place. Yeah. I love the fact that it was handwritten. Um, <laughs> Wait, was it handwritten or partly? I can't remember now. No, no it's all either. handwritten. Oh, I mean, okay, it's enough. Because yeah. um, there was one point where I switched to the computer, but I hadn't, it was pretty early, early computer moment. So I was handwriting in dynamics. So, and so then the notes were computer, Printed, but then handwritten. But I forgot this was. Yeah, that's. Yeah, gets me back. <laughs> I kind of like it. I mean, I I kind of feel like there. I, I I feel like I can hear a difference with people who started handwriting versus people that have only worked on computers. And there's something, and you know, because people associate certain kinds of, or, or certain schools of music, I don't really believe in genre, but um, the, you know, with a kind of, oh, this is like, um, this sounds like a machine or, or, or like um, something that's not human. So I think it's a way to kind of dismiss it actually. But what's interesting to me is that um, you can see sometimes just the care even if it's, even if um, a section is repeated, but even you can see in the actual engraving how it's written with the pen or the pencil, the different meaning. I know it sounds strange, but it's like even the slightest mush of a dot or something. Oh, and some of those old scores are so beautiful, and it, that is that's you know artistically that's it's kind of a loss when you look at those old George Crum scores. And, I mean, you know, even the scratchy Louis Andreessen scores that are totally raw and the energy you can see it like what you're saying you can see it on the page um I, I i'm grateful for the new tools too actually because um you're right you can't you can't just rely on the, the computer playback um, it's it's it lies to you um and it can be very mechanical um but there's something about um that i enjoy about the distance of being able to kind of get a sense of time i remember in the early days just being at the piano, writing with pencil on the paper. Um, it, I always found it challenging to get a sense of duration. Like, how long, how long was that? Like, it felt that long. And I guess if I use my stopwatch, it's that long. Um, 
but there's so I do I do use computing a, a lot of times for sort of lengths of sections, um, uh, but it it doesn't tell the truth. And um, people can do some pretty good simulations <laughs> these days, but um, but I think in the end, uh, yeah. And 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 I think a lot of composers go back and forth. As I can say, I do between. Um, getting the score onto Sibelius, which is what I use, and then going back to the piano and getting the notebooks out. And I do a lot of, let's see a notebook right here. Oh, here's one. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time doodling. Okay, yes, doodling. But I, I have tons of notebooks. Yes, this is one of my favorite yellow ones. Um, where I'm just writing down thoughts. So it's good to step away from, let's say if you're working on, on, on a laptop or you're working on a desktop, step away from it. Think, write in journals, write in notes. Usually I'm writing words down more than, sometimes I write little scratchy notes down too on this, but um, it's good to take a walk. I like it, I like it, I take a walk, I go, things just click. You know, it's so interesting. Like I'll be banging my head, like, how am I gonna fix this section? I gotta, get, I gotta go out and take a walk. And on that walk, I go, oh yeah, it's just a little, you breathe a little bit and you get a little distance. And I don't know if you feel that as a performer, but just that walk can really like, you know, give you a moment of openness. And so, yeah, you can walk to, you know, it's challenging right at this moment, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I usually work off paper and um, it's only been the pandemic that has, so I was working on your piece on um, an iPad, which I'm, it's not that I'm against iPads, but I think it's, I like seeing even erasure marks on paper so I can see how, you know, the different, it might not be still in pencil, but I can see like how much, even from like the wear and tear of the paper, how many times I've rethought this section over and over again, um, which I, I, you don't get on an iPad, right? Because it's like perfectly erased and then you will never know what happened before. Mm -hmm. Why about that? There's no history. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I printed out your score just, because for me, um, paper gives me more of a sense of uh, the structure because like on PDFs or on screens, it's like maximum two, two pages at the same time. And I can't feel like the, the amount in my hand. And then I can't kind of have a larger concept of the whole piece. I feel like unless I have it in my hand, um, I don't know, maybe I feel like I sound like I'm super old fashioned. Yeah, if I'm, if I'm in a rehearsal, I'm, I, I I got this iPad thinking, oh, this is great. I don't have to carry any scores with me. Good. And I can't deal with it at all in the rehearsal. You know, so it's, a big, it's a big score. Like, Wait, how do I scroll and find where I'm at? I always you prefer can't to find anything, right? The paper in my hand, turn to the page. And that, I, uh, I'm old fashioned that way. <laughs> but I also feel that I like to hold the book and um, turn the page. People are going to say that we're so like 20th century. <laughs> Although maybe it'll come back in style. <laughs> oh yeah, like final. We're actually ahead of the curve. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is there anything else you want you'd like to talk about? Um, well, I think it's remarkable that you're doing this right now. I mean, you're in residence, the Library of Congress, and um, you know, there's this need to create and need to make art and and sometimes I think it's kind of, well, I think personally it's saving me through this time period, very stressful and um, confusing and overwhelming time period and on so many levels and, and so, for so many reasons. And the music just takes you somewhere else. You know, you can just dive right in and, and get it all out into the music or escape, whatever, however the music works for you. Um, and so that you're doing that, you know, staying creative and active and playing and it's an inspiration. I think it's an inspiration for all other younger players who are wondering, well, ah, <laughs> what's next? I mean, it's going to go away, you know, eventually. Um, but uh, to take this moment and, and make things happen is, is, is fantastic. I hope like the younger performers know or younger musicians that I or all of us are, are also failing. Ah, <laughs> except um, we just have a longer history so we know that there will be an end to this particular period so there is the next um the next chapter will will come but it doesn't make this period of time easier i think but 
at least we can be comforted that we'll get on the other side of this. <laughs> it's been hard for, uh, I mean, I, 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 so for this recital, um, I haven't played with another person for, well, first of all, I, you know, I started in Suzuki violin, which means I started really young. I started at three years old and in Suzuki, they have you up on stage. Granted, it's like those like group performances, you know, where everybody's playing, I don't know, twinkle, twinkle, little star together, you know, but I, and, and I played, um, it was the first live show I had played since I think the first couple days of March, I, I did, I think last week at Lincoln Center outside and I actually broke down crying. Yeah, oh, it was very hard to imagine. Yeah, I haven't gone this long without performing since before I was three years old, which is a really long time. <laughs> Crazy, yeah. Yeah, and then not making, so it was really, um, it felt really meaningful to make music with Tom. Um, and uh, even though, you know, we didn't see you in person and didn't um, rehearse with you in person, it meant a lot to, that you took the time also um, to listen to us, even though it's not ideal, of course, on Zoom. Um, I mean, I mean, considering, it's, I mean, I almost feel like how did we luck out that this technology hit this point when this crisis happened? I mean, if you go back ten years, we, 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 not ten years, five years maybe, even. and there's still little glitches, you know, still things working. But that I can reverse with you guys, uh, and I'm in Massachusetts, and you're you were in upstate, upstate New York at the moment. Um, that's crazy. It's like some weird sci-fi magic, you know. Um, so I, I do really appreciate that. It would be far more isolated not, not to have it. Like you said, like, the sound is going to be different. But, you know, I, I can hear through bad speakers. I, I can hear the, <laughs> you know, it's not a great. And, and so uh, I, I felt really happy to connect. It's like, yeah, people, hello. <laughs> music. Um, Live music. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wonderful that you played outdoors. I think that that's, you know, that's, some of this is very interesting. Some of these creative um, efforts to combat this situation we're in, playing outside. I love the eating outside. It's just amazing. In New York City, where I'm most of the time, uh, <laughs> you know, my streets have been taken over. They, they, they took over the sidewalk. They took over the parking places. And they put tables there. And then heaters. Or whatever. You know, I'm just like, yeah. It's cool, you know, and it, it's it's obviously for a very terrible reason that they have to do it, but the, the ingenuity and the and the drive to to make things alive and keep going is is beautiful. So there are these silver linings, and I think you guys playing together, getting together, and finding a way to do this program, it's a beautiful thing, and um, it just shows the spirit of, of you and and the music. Music to music, it'll get us through to the end of this pandemic. It will, it will. <laughs>